Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burrs. Join me today is Patrick G. Eddington, a senior fellow at Homeland Security and Civil Liberties at the Cato Institute. From 2004 to 2014, he served as communications director and later senior policy advisor to Representative Rush Holt. Welcome back to the show, Pat. It's always good to be with you, my friend. So why are some Cato scholars maybe guilty of treason? Well, I, I would say that the way that I would probably phrase it is that some folks at the Maritime Administration or some of their allies uh, in the private sector who benefit uh, conspicuously from the Jones Act, which we can talk about a little bit here if you'd like, uh, definitely- uh, we, don't, we don't have to get into the Jones Act. It's like, that's not your area. But but just for a second, explain what it is for the listeners. Yeah. So, um, you know, the Jones Act itself has, has been around since- uh, I believe 1920. And the short answer is this is a statute that requires anything that's going to be shipped in intracoastal American waters. So think trying to move something from, let's say, the port of LA to the to the port of Tacoma uh, in Washington State has to be carried on a US flagged vessel with a US crew. Now, for those who haven't been kind of keeping score, uh, the US Merchant Marine is minuscule compared to what it was a hundred years ago. Uh, and so this kind of, of a completely outdated law winds up not only costing taxpayers um, and consumers an enormous amount of money on a yearly basis. And if you want the, on the details on that, just look at what our, our colleague uh, Colin Graybow has written about that uh, uh, on the Cato website. But what it also does is it can actually really endanger uh, recoveries after hurricanes and things like that. And so you know, Puerto Rico has had to request waivers repeatedly, Jones Act waivers repeatedly, uh, in order to actually be able to get supplies, uh, recovery supplies and the like, into uh, the territory in order to basically feed and clothe people and get them clean water and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So um, this is a topic uh, trying to, f- to get Congress interested in doing something about the Jones Act uh, has been a major priority of Cato for the last five years or so. And um, our, our colleague, uh, Colin Graybow, has just been remorseless uh, in just methodically going after all the problems in this act. Well, uh, you know, some of, his, uh, some of his predecessors, some of our prior colleagues were very remorseless about it as well. And so we discovered through a completely separate source uh, a couple of years ago that the Maritime Administration was keeping track of what Cato was writing and doing in, in, this, in, this, in this particular arena. So we made a decision to file some of our own Freedom of Information Act requests to see what we could come up with. And and lo and behold, um, after uh, I managed to win uh, a B-5 deliberative process related appeal, and we can talk about what that means in more detail as we go along, um, they, they unredacted a bunch of material uh, in which at a particular Maritime Administration uh, Advisory Committee meeting in March of 2020, It was suggested uh, by one or more people on this particular panel, and we don't know whether this was a government person or somebody from private industry or some combination of the two, but this is an official U.S. government maritime administration advisory committee funded by your taxpayer dollars. And it was suggested that then President Trump should charge Cato and Mercatus Institute scholars, Mercatus Center uh, colleagues, uh, with treason uh, for what they've been doing to highlight the problems with the Joan Act, Jones Act. And it was also suggested that the president should let the Heritage Foundation know that he would essentially disavow them and never come to any of their events again if they continue to pound away in the same way. So this is an example of the power of the Freedom of Information Act to shine light on the kinds of chicanery that we know goes on uh, behind the scenes in government. Let's get into that statute, which a lot of people have heard of, I think, uh, which is good, uh, when it came about and how it's purportedly, we'll get into how it actually works uh, in terms of how you have to sue them. And But it purportedly, what is it supposed to do and when did it come about? <clears throat> we owe the Freedom of Information Act's existence to the late Representative John Moss, a Democrat of California. When he got into Congress during the uh, Eisenhower administration, basically the beginning of Eisenhower's second term, he was part of a wave, essentially, uh, of some new members in the House and Senate coming in 
who were really beginning to kind of question a lot of, of these Cold War paradigms that had just been seemingly literally in stone for so long. And one of those, of course, is this whole issue of, of government secrecy. And five years, um, you know, before Moss took the helm uh, of this um, of the subcommittee on the House uh, Government Operations Committee that that he was a part of, five years before that, of course, we had the infamous decision in the Reynolds case in which the Supreme Court of the United States uh, let the United States Air Force basically refuse to provide any information about a particular uh, B-29 plane crash uh, that had occurred uh, a few years earlier. And they were hiding this essentially behind national security. And this is where we get this entire concept of the so-called state secrets privilege, even though there is absolutely nothing in the text of the Constitution of the United States that permits such a thing. But we can talk about that uh, in more detail later. So in any event, you know, the Reynolds case and and some related things that were going on in this period really kind of, I think, torqued off Moss in a lot of ways. And during the Eisenhower administration, he had been trying to get information out of the Civil Service Commission uh, about the number of of cases uh, under the so-called loyalty program. This is Executive Order uh, 10450. Um, And this is the one that led to the dismissal of thousands, tens of thousands uh, of government employees over alleged communist ties and all the rest of that. Uh, and applicants as well, folks who were actually applying for federal jobs. So Ma started by going after the Civil Service Commission, and then he subsequently turned his attention to DOD, and he held a whole series of hearings in the subcommittee between 1955 and 1959, and ultimately issued reports that really just kind of called out a lot of the insanity that was going on there. Um, and a lot of this is chronicled in Michael uh, Lemov's really great book, People's Warrior, John Moss and the Fight for Freedom of Information. And consumer rights. We're not going to really talk about consumer rights here today. Um, But I just wanted to kind of go over some of these things very quickly that were in the 1966 report from the full government operations committee. So these are just some of the examples of the kind of insanity that Moss and his colleagues were encountering. The National Science Foundation decided it would not be in the quote public interest, end quote, to disclose competing cost estimates submitted by bidders for the award of a multi-million dollar deep sea study. The Navy ruled that telephone directories fell within the category of information relating to, quote, internal management, end quote, of the Navy and could not be released. The Postmaster General, one of my least favorite uh, entities, by the way, the U.S. Post Office, ruled that the public was, quote, not directly concerned, end quote, in knowing the names and salaries of postal employees. I would beg to differ. Many federal agencies refused to disclose the opinions of dissenting members, let's say on boards and commissions, for example even when a vote or an issue had been taken. And then finally, the Board of Engineers for Rivers and Harbors, which ruled on billions of dollars of federal construction projects, said that, quote, good cause had not been shown to disclose the minutes of its meetings and the votes of its members on awarding contracts. So again, an enormous amount uh, of effort to try to conceal, you know, how your tax dollars are being uh, expended. And again, none of this is so-called national security related. You know, in any kind of conventional sense, we're not talking about protecting the identities of of spies or their sources. We're not talking about protecting cryptography, <laughs> right, and existing uh, you know code ciphers and all the rest of that kind of good stuff. So this is what gets Moss <clears throat> and and a lot of his uh, allies really kind of juiced, and they finally do get uh, you know the bill introduced in the House. There is an identical Senate companion, but the House leadership, uh, which is democratically controlled at this point. Uh, at the behest of the Johnson administration, is basically trying to strangle the bill, right? So Moss, even though he's been the lead guy on this for 12 years by this point, um, he decides to go ahead and let the Senate move first. And that turns out to be just a brilliant parliamentary tactic because the Senate moved it no problem. And then uh, he, he did have some allies in the House, but they're not the usual suspects that you would expect. A couple of guys by the name of Don Rumsfeld and Jerry Ford uh, Rumsfeld at the time was, a at that point, a two-term uh, member uh, from Indiana, if I recall correctly. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Gerald Ford was House Minority Leader at the time from Michigan and would, of course, go on to become uh, subsequently vice president and then president of the United States. I don't think it's any coincidence that these two guys were on the opposite side of the aisle and they saw a really great opportunity, uh, you know, to stick it to the Johnson administration. And that, you know, as long as it serves the larger purpose, you know, I'm fine. You know, that that works great. So uh, the bill was finally moved to Johnson's desk on June 20th. Um, he basically was threatening to pocket veto it. He got an enormous amount of pressure. And then finally, one of his senior aides, 
uh, Bill Moyers, uh, who of course has gone on to become, you know, a major media maven over the course of the last five decades, really convinced him, you know, you need to do this. And so he did sign it on July 4th, 1966. And then he went on the campaign trail, of course, to claim credit for, uh, for a bill that he opposed from the outset. So that's how we essentially got the original act. It has been amended uh, multiple times, 1996, 2002, 2007, 2009, and most recently in 2016, uh, to address a range of things, from things as relatively prosaic uh, as attorney's fees, although if you're an attorney finding a FOIA case, there's nothing prosaic about it, uh, all the way up to the creation of this so-called foreseeable harm standard in the 2016 version. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that every single one of these moves by Congress to amend FOIA over the last several decades has been driven by just constant agency intransigence. They, they'll try to find one way or another to slip out or slip out from underneath having to comply with the statute. And uh, it continues to be a major problem. There is a, a bill uh, that has not been publicly released yet, I will say, uh, by Senators Leahy and uh, Grassley that is designed to address still more problems that a lot of us who do this uh, for a living have been concerned about. It is unclear whether that bill will actually make it uh, through this Congress or not, because we're very late. Uh, we're on the on the cusp of the midterms. So we'll see where that goes. So I guess on that point, I just simply say, stay tuned. So what is the process? Um, you request information from a department. Do you have to really get specific on what you're looking for? Do you have to say, I am looking for everything about, uh, let's use a, an example pertinent to you, Gulf War Syndrome, uh, and I want everything that the CIA has about Gulf War Syndrome. Is, is that a bad FOIA request? Is that too broad? Yeah. yeah. You, you, will, you will basically wind up getting shot down and courts will back up executive branch agencies and departments if you make the mistake of using the phrase any or everything, essentially, in your request. Um, there is a way to slip around that, though, uh, which is still completely statutorily valid. And that's where essentially what you're asking for are records. And I normally cite a, a specific part of the code, um, U.S. code, that actually defines records uh, so that, again, they don't have a way to slither out of that aspect of it. And then I will endeavor, you know, to be as specific as possible. I mean, obviously, if there is a specific report that you have seen mentioned in the press that has not been released, that's pretty much gold. Uh, very difficult for them to kind of, uh, you know, deny that that necessarily exists. They'll still try to do it. I've encountered that. But it makes it very hard. But if there's also something that's of extreme, you know, public significance, you know, we could use something like the January 6th um, attempted coup mass riot, whatever term of art you prefer for that particular event. Um, you'd also need to be relatively specific there, I think, um, because there's obviously just a a mountain of information um, that that's relevant there. Now, on the other side of this, so maybe you know specifically, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if at your time in the CIA you ever were on the other side of a request, or but you know what it's like if a agency, if a government office of some sort gets a request uh what do they do uh how what is the process that they're supposed to go through there then i guess the other question which is the hidden one is what, what is the actual process because as you say they they don't like this very much and it takes a lot of their time actually well it i, I mean it does and almost no agency or department actually has like a line item uh, for FOIA, you know, in their budget justification request that they send uh, to OMB, you know, every year during the budget cycle, which which to me is a giant problem. I think that's that's another um, statutory area that I think the Congress probably needs to weigh in on. They they need to be requiring that. Yeah, there could be like you know five employees who just deal with FOIA requests or something, probably more. <laughs> yeah, and what we've seen over the course of the last uh, couple of decades, especially, is a very conscious effort on the part of agencies and departments to outsource this. So they literally have contractors, you know, handling this. And, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, what, what that does is it creates, you know, exactly the wrong kind of incentives for making the system work because what are the contractors essentially probably going to get rated on? How many requests did they successfully close and make go away? Right. 
So there is an incentive to find a reason um, to, to basically deny a request, which is why, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff out there that can be really helpful uh, if you want to try to get involved in this thing. But there's a little something called the FOIA wiki. You can find this uh, online. <clears throat> Our friends uh, at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and a number of other organizations um, have been responsible for putting this bad boy together. Uh, it's got lots and lots of great stuff on it about uh, not just major uh, previous court cases that implicate each one of these nine exemptions uh, that come into play, but they've also got really great tips on there for how to handle uh, you know, making your own FOIA request. But the, the long and the short of it is, you know, agencies basically, once you've actually submitted a request, an agency by statute has 20 days to respond. And if they fail to respond in that 20 day period, you know, on day 21, technically you can sue. Now, as a general rule, uh, most people who work in this field will advise you against doing that. Um, <clears throat> they'll usually tell you, and I think it's just a good practice to simply make a telephone call to the agency. If you can, if the agency actually makes a number available that you can actually do, uh, my former employer at the Central Intelligence Agency, among the very worst, um, they have a fax number. I and am shocked that they are, <laughs> they are not very good at this. I am just <laughs> so you you have to send them a fax. Have you done that? Have you have you oh, yeah. FOIA'd oh, CIA yeah. and then oh, send yeah. them a fax saying, yeah. "Hey, by the way, I yeah. I sent you a FOIA request." Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so you know you have to close that loop. You have to see you know whether or not they actually did get it, <clears throat> and if they did confirm it. Uh, and they're outside the 20 days, uh, you know, then technically, you know, you could go forward. But as a general rule, courts really frown on you coming to them unless you've exhausted, you know, all your administrative appeals and so on and so forth. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, <clears throat> suing at day 21 or 22 or whatever is necessarily off the table uh, as long as you have access to counsel who can who can sue on your behalf. And if it's a super high... Um, high interest, you know, kind of event, you know, breaking news or something like that. Um, if you're in a position, you know, to move on something like that, then, you know, it's probably worth taking the shot. Um, but as a general rule, most of the time when people are filing FOIAs, even within the public policy community here uh, and the media community in DC, it's, it's usually over stuff that's been going on for a while. Uh, and they're trying to kind of set themselves up for, you know, some kind of a major story or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you don't exhaust administrative appeals, you are absolutely going to get your rear end handed to you by the federal courts, especially if you're in the D.C. circuit. That's just axiomatic. That makes sense. But I mean, I, just, I see why they would do that. But OK, so you have you get some information. Um, I don't know if you want to use a specific example about something you, you've recently done, but you get you, you ask for something, get some information. And then usually it seems that you end up going back and saying you guys didn't give me everything that you have or, or you have some suspicion. H how do you form the suspicion that they're holding it back? Cause I would presume as I think you would, that they are holding something back. I mean, that, that would be just a, a general presumption. They don't want to give you this information. They'll yeah. give you the littlest they possibly can. And so then you come back and you say, all right, give me more. Yeah. So just for the benefit of our audience, it's important to understand that when FOIA was created, there were a series of exemptions uh, that agencies and departments could cite to withhold information. <clears throat> At present, there are nine of these. Um, exemption one deals with issues of classification and uh, declassification. In other words, you know, secret, top secret, confidential, all that good stuff. Exemption two governs internal agency rules. Exemption three, which is one of my least favorite, uh, is prohibited uh, by other statutes from being disclosed. That's a big one. Exemption four, trade secrets and commercial info. That was the subject of a huge 2019 case, uh, Argus Leader versus Food Marketing Institute. It is, it is a big pain for an awful lot of folks, and we can talk about that uh, if, if you'd like. But uh, that's also something that uh, La Leahy and Grassley desperately want to try to address. Exemption five, within the public policy community here in D.C., uh, this is probably the one that makes people put their head through the wall. Uh, this covers so-called discovery privileges, including the infamous deliberative process privilege. Um, this is the one that allows them to basically hide anything about anything that is uh, involving an alleged pending decision uh, on, a, uh, on a policy issue. Exemption six is personal privacy. 
Um, exemption seven is law enforcement, and there are about uh, six different subcategories uh, underneath that where they can basically weigh in. Exemption eight deals with regulation of financial institutions, so SEC, that kinds of things. And exemption nine deals with public water wells. Don't ask me. I, I have literally no idea to, why that was a thing. <laughs> Maybe uh, like poisoning the water, I, like some I, sort of fear of It could be, you know. I, I, that's that's the one I really haven't researched that, that much. That that, um, that was not on my bingo card actually, <laughs> <laughs> for what an exemption would be. So. It's it was not on mine either when I first started working this. Definitely. So the, yeah, so I mean, yeah, we the, go. The we, fifth one is the one that's most common for for your work. Well, I it, it's common for in, entirely too many people, you know, who work in this particular field. But in in my work and and what I do here at the nexus of of the Bill of Rights and security, kind of writ large. What I deal with more often than not is B1 uh, and B3, B3 exemptions because my beloved former employer, the Central Intelligence Agency, through the CIA Act of 1949, gets to keep secret all of its operational records, which I think is insane. Um, there's no reason to do that you know, for, uh, for any, any length of time, let's say beyond 50 years at the outside, the absolute outside, unless it deals specifically with a still living source. Uh, who is still providing information, you know, to the agency? I mean, I can understand that, and I can even understand that the B seven D in the law enforcement exemption arena, the B seven D exemption, is the one that deals with, you know, confidential human sources. And you know, if it's a legit, uh, legitimately predicated investigation, um, that's understandable. The problem is, we often find out that these investigations um, are not legitimately predicated. And so you wind up essentially uh, being able to use uh, the statute to kind of, um, you know, cover what you're doing, you know, if you're a federal law enforcement official, whether it's, you know, on the up and up or not. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of skepticism about the invocation uh, of these of these particular exemptions is really important. And and you mentioned B5. <clears throat> and in the case of, of this stuff that we've been dealing with, with the Maritime Administration on the Jones Act related uh, matter. They were actually invoking B5 to try to uh, prevent us from seeing what they had to say at a public event at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Now, that's a flagrant, I mean, just off the charts misuse of B5 in that kind of circumstance. Here, here's an example of, of a B5 invocation that, that would be completely spot on, uh, a current treaty negotiation, especially if that treaty negotiation was not exactly public. Right. If, if the if the administration was trying to work out the basic details with the foreign country and then wanted to, you know, kind of come public that I can completely understand uh, to me, that would be a legitimate invocation of B5. But more often than not, we what we find when we're able to kind of crack that shield is that they've used it to hide stuff that had no business being hidden in, in the first place, especially stuff that uh, if it were made public would be embarrassing, like accusing people in the public policy community of treason for being in the public policy community. And that gets sort of into some of the stuff you've been doing for, for quite a while at Cato and, and even in, in some ways before with looking at how the government is tracking or spying on various groups that are determined, that are considered dangerous. Yeah. I'm, I'm putting that in scare quotes. Yeah. And, and this, and this of course has a rich history. You can start wherever you want. Um, <laughs> we have an entire timeline. We will link in the show notes that <laughs> Pat has put together about this. It's pretty, st I, my, my favorite one is the folk singers, to be honest, the spy yeah. on the folk singers, because you yeah. know, they're all pinko commies and we knew that to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, but they're dangerous. We got to, we got to spy on the folk singers. But, yeah. So th yeah. they're, they're, they've liked to spy on groups uh, they don't want to tell you about it, and they still do it today. And, and I think in the timeline that Trevor is referring to is called American Big Brother, um, which I created in early 2015, um, in in part to basically help organize my thoughts for for the current uh, current book that uh, I have in in um, in peer review at Georgetown University Press, um, The Triumph of Fear. And and the entire concept here, of course, is that for the last century century plus at this point, various federal agencies uh, and departments, uh, law enforcement, and then later on, you know, the actual intelligence elements have done an awful lot, you know, to spy on uh, domestic civil society organizations. And, and I began this project, uh, not just the timeline, but the book, 
with the question and at the same time the assumption that what the church committee did in the in the mid 1970s up through the very late 1970s to try to circumscribe this stuff had probably been overcome by events and and when you kind of look at the available data that's exactly what it shows and so that informs uh, my FOIA work at Cato because all these other groups that that we are uh, that we work with, whether it's IJ uh, on the right or groups like Demand Progress on the left or Defending Rights and Dissent, you know, fill in the blank. Groups that work in the immigration space, the American Immigration Council, and so on and so forth. All those groups are basically out there in civil society working on a, a specific public policy problem that they want to see solved. And, and the leadership of most of those organizations, whether it's at the staff level or their CEOs or board of directors or whatever, that's where their head is at. And that's where it should be at in terms of like trying to get their mission accomplished. So most of the time, they're just not thinking about whether or not their activities might necessarily be drawing the interest of law enforcement, right? Whether it's a legitimate reason or not, 99% of the time, not a legitimate reason. And so the core of, of what I try to do in my day-to-day -day practice here is essentially have their backs, you know, by putting in FOIAs with the FBI and other federal law enforcement and intelligence organizations to find out what records they have on our friends in the public policy community. Um, and we've, we've found a lot. Um, not, not shockingly. And I don't think we're finding everything by any stretch of the imagination because of another provision of FOIA. This is section 552C that actually gives agencies and departments the ability to lie to you, the requester, uh, about whether or not they actually have data if they have an ongoing investigation, right? And, and I've become convinced that in some ways, there are hints in a lot of these, you know, we have no records responsive to the FOIA responses that I've been getting, uh, because that's kind of magic language in my view. Um, we've also in the past received what are known as Glomar responses. And that phrase Glomar is derived from a deep sea research vessel called the Glomar Explorer that my former employer, the Central Intelligence Agency, I really hate having to mention them so much in this podcast. Oh, no, but, we, we but, have to do but, our little shout out, though, <laughs> too, actually, by the way, because uh, one of the times you were on before, we called that episode, the CIA listens to free thoughts, because hopefully they're, because they monitor you. And so hopefully they're listening to this. So I just want to give a shout out to our lords and masters at the CIA and say, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Uh, all right, continue back. <laughs> and they do monitor me. We we know that on the basis uh, of a Privacy Act suit that uh, that I have underway, uh, in which literally um, major uh, op-eds that I have I published uh, uh, during my time here at Cato uh, have been declared non-compliant uh, by the uh, CIA's Publication Review Board, even though they do not generally mention the Central Intelligence Agency by name. They're usually talking about other three-letter agencies. Uh, and usually in a congressional oversight context. And and so, you know, coming back to this whole issue of, of the Glomar Explorer, um, the agency went to Howard Hughes, who owned the vessel, uh, the late billionaire Howard Hughes, uh, and wanted to use it to try to raise uh, a S Soviet uh, ballistic missile submarine that had gone down in the Pacific. The agency had good location data on it to try to salvage the vessel and get any kind of documents off of it and so on and so forth. And they... Uh, put out a cover story essentially when they were asked about it um, that uh, uh, with the you know, Glomar Explorer, what it was doing uh, was it was out there, you know, doing uh, deep sea mining for magnesium nodules, which is a thing, uh, a legitimate thing and apparently a very lucrative thing from what I can gather. And totally something Howard Hughes would just do, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> like, all right like, ab, I mean, he might be looking for Atlantis, you know, at that point. Yeah. Yep, yep. So in any event, uh, needless to say, that uh, that did not stick. Uh, some journalists began uh, sniffing around. Uh, and when they did, and they began to get into a position to publish that the agency was using this vessel, um, the, the, Helm, the, uh, the head of the agency at the time, Richard Helms, or not Richard Helms, uh, Dick Colby, was so terrified about the operation being blown that he started going around to editorial boards saying, you can't say this, you can't do this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, uh, you know, a, a news organization did do it um, and they put in a FOIA because they were trying to actually get hard data on this. They weren't, 
they weren't content to just go with rumor, which I think is a good journalistic practice. And uh, the agency said, we can't confirm or deny that. And it goes all the way up uh, through the courts and the courts side with the agency. And this is how the so-called Glomar exception is created. And so you, if you get a FOIA response that says, we can neither confirm nor deny that we have information on you or this organization or whatever, that is what a Glomar looks like. So there are lots of different ways that they try to slither out of, out of responding. And uh, that's certainly one of them. Interestingly, I, I, I know an obscenely large amount about submarines. I might've mentioned this to you before, Pat, but like, I know a lot about submarines and they did raise half of that submarine. They lost half of it in the, uh, it fell back to, and then they buried the Soviet uh, seamen who were, that they pulled up and they sent the video to the Soviet Union and said, we, we raised your sub uh, and we, but we gave full honors to the deceased seamen. So I, I don't know if you know that part of the story, but yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it wasn't actually until 2010 in the uh, agency's internal publication studies and intelligence that they actually acknowledged the operation. Oh, really? It took that long? We yeah. all knew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the question now is, who are they spying on? I mean, what if what if, what do you what groups are you looking into in terms of who the the agencies, three letter agencies, might be spying on? Yeah, so you know we have or we have, have a number a file of exa- on. Yeah, yeah, we we have a number of examples that we have been able to surface. Um, you know, one of them uh, was actually the Albany, New York chapter of the League of Women Voters, and and here when well, I'm going to talk specifically about some FBI examples because. It is the FBI that tends to be the agency that, uh, at the federal level, that tends to engage in this the most, although hardly exclusively. But because the FBI has had essentially the so-called domestic security mission for almost its entire existence, um, this is really bread and butter, you know, for the FBI. So, in the case of the uh, Albany, New York chapter of the League of Women Voters. In 2010. I mean, I have to be honest. I've been, I thought they were sketchy for quite a while. So <laughs> <laughs> Especially the Albany chapter. Let's be honest. <laughs> so the Albany FBI field office uh, goes to these folks in 2010 and says, hey, uh, you know, tell us about corruption in the New York State legislature. And, and the people at, at the League of Women Voters there were just like, say again, you know, we, we have no idea what you're talking about. So this was conducted under the uh, a, a, a relatively new FBI authority called an assessment. Um, this was a category that was created in December 2008 by then Attorney General Michael Mukasey. And unlike a preliminary investigation or a full field investigation or enterprise level investigation, um, assessments require absolutely no criminal predicate to be open just a so-called authorized purpose. And guess who gets to decide what that authorized purpose is? The Department of Justice. So it's a great gig if you can get it, I suppose, to be able to go out and do this kind of thing. So uh, anyway, we managed to get that data, including some of the agent notes and all the rest of that, uh, you know, from that particular interview. Um, And then one of the more recent ones uh, was a July 2016 Washington field office uh, so-called charity assessment. This was a new one on me. I had never seen that specific uh, category before, whereby uh, an analyst in the Washington field office sitting at their desk just decided to take a look uh, at a a conservative women's group called Concerned Women for America, been around for decades, absolutely no evidence of any ties to a hostile foreign power or foreign agent or agent of a foreign power. Um, uh, an impeccable record with with the IRS and all the rest of that, but this individual in the FBI field office, you know, tooled around both on commercial databases like Charity Navigator and some others, but also apparently used um, classified or proprietary FBI databases to take a look at this particular organization, and uh, you know they they determined that there was nothing going on, but the point of the exercise was it should never have been conducted in the first place. And I think this just also gets to like the bureaucratic incentives, right? Because if you stop and think about what do FBI agents, what do their supervisors, what do unit chiefs, uh, what do section chiefs, what do all those folks up the chain, what do they get rated on at the end of the day? What, what, what are their performance reviews essentially kind of revolve around? 
well, how many assessments have you opened? How many, you know, PIs have you opened? How many full investigations? How many enterprise? How many people did you participate in getting plea deals from? And so on and so forth. So it becomes this giant bureaucratic numbers game. And when you lower the standard for opening an investigation, you are incentivizing people to do that. When you tell them that this is how, in essence, you're going to be rated, right? You're incentivizing that kind of behavior. And I think one of the most dramatic examples of uh, the Bureau investigating a nonprofit that we have come across so far involves our friends at the National Security Archive over at George Washington University. This is an entity that has existed since um, the early 1980s. It was one of the first kind of um, specialized uh, purpose Freedom of Information Act clearinghouses and investigative elements that was created essentially um, in that particular period. And they've they've done just amazing work over the years. As their uh, title implies, they're very, very focused on defense and foreign policy and things of that nature. But they were also concerned uh, that their activities might have come to the attention of the Department of Justice, might be of interest to the FBI. And so in 2005, they submitted a FOIA <clears throat> on themselves to the FBI and essentially said, tell us what you have. And the agency, uh, the FBI came back and said, we don't have anything. Now, I strongly suspected that that was a lie, um, just given the nature of the work that they do and the kind of interaction that they have with foreign nationals, for example, the kind of events that the archive has done over the years. So it was one of the groups uh, on which I submitted a FOIA in 2019. And lo and behold, uh, after more than a year, uh, I get back, uh, I guess, about 50 pages of material that dates from the early 1980s. And in, in in contained in that material, in fact, was a cable from then FBI Director William Sessions uh, to the Washington Field Office and other elements saying, in essence, forward everything that you have on the National Security Archive to us. And as I dug into this, what I realized was a former Justice Department attorney by the name of Quinn Shea, who was one of their early Freedom of Information Act gurus in the Office of Information Policy, had defected from DOJ to the National Security Archive. And so they had they clearly had a keen interest uh, in, in what he was doing, uh, you know, to help them essentially help the archive, uh, you know, penetrate essentially this, this veil of secrecy that FOIA is actually designed to pierce. So it's fascinating reading. Um, they clearly conducted a level of physical and possibly even electronic surveillance. Um, the documents themselves are heavily redacted, uh, but we know that archive officials did go to the Cuban interest section uh, in DC uh, in preparation for essentially some commemorative events around the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on, and that they also traveled uh, to Cuba itself in that period. And there's no question that the Bureau was tracking that. No, no, no doubt in my mind about that. So my message to anybody that is at a think tank that does work that involves interaction with foreign nationals, you can probably take it for granted <laughs> that the FBI has taken at least some level of interest um, in your interaction with foreign nationals and, and the events that, uh, that you're putting on with them or inviting them to and so on and so forth. And again, that raises all kinds of at least in my mind, First Amendment and free association related questions. Oh, yeah. You know, if, absolutely. If, yeah. If, but I feel if, like if you don't have a file, you're not doing your job right too, at the same time. <laughs> you know, I've spoke, I feel I'm, that I'm way. flying to Iceland, you know, this evening, as you know, and like, they probably <laughs> opened a file on me and my friends there. And I've spoken Serbia. You know, I've, I've spoken yeah. all over the world, right? So I, I better have a file. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd be willing to bet our friend uh, and colleague Doug Bandow has a large one. Oh, um, he definitely has a large <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that, of course, raises the question, what does the Cato file say? Yeah. So that involves Glomar. Um, that's the kind of response we got the first time out. I, and we got that response on 22 other groups in addition to ours, by the way. And, and the point that I try to make to some of my friends in the privacy and civil liberties community is this, and it's a very important point. When they give you a Glomar, it really does mean they have something. That's what the historical record tells us so far. Uh, we know this from, from the ACLU's case with respect to the drone wars, where initially they got glomarred and the court said, no, 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 too many administration officials have basically acknowledged this, but they still let the agency withhold the date on the drone program, right? But that glomar was pierced. Other glomars have been exposed in the end that, that have shown, in fact, 
that they have data uh, on the organization in question. So in Cato's case, I waited about another six months or so after I got that first Glomar response. And then I changed things up just a little bit, and I utilized not just uh, the Institute's name, but also a series of country and other keyword type uh, material. And then they finally came back and and basically uh, said, yeah, I, we, you know, we may have data, et cetera, et cetera, but they drug their heels. So we wound up suing. Um, that suit is ongoing. But the material that they've produced so far has been of a relatively, I would call, mundane nature, right? In the past, the Institute uh, has received death threats. It has received uh, specific employees have received death threats. Um, other things have been, you know, a little bit more mundane. Um, uh, back in the day, uh, a case invited Louis Free to come over <laughs> uh, and give a talk. Uh, this was we had a conference in China. We had a conference in the Soviet Union. You know, yeah, in this, the eighties. Yeah, yeah. So this was this was in nineteen ninety six. Um, but our specific interest uh, in this particular circumstance centers around an incident that occurred in the fall of twenty twelve, when we know on the basis of a debriefing that I did. Uh, of, of a Cato employee at the time uh, when I arrived at Cato, that two FBI officers from the Washington field office came to our building and debriefed a colleague, interrogated a colleague in that colleague's office about some of the things that that colleague had written, all of which was completely First Amendment protected in every way, shape, and form. The FBI has continued thus far to deny that they have any information about that particular incident. Um, I don't buy that. Uh, what they, what the FBI also does, and I think this is the, what I would put in the pro tip category for those who are interested in, in going after the FBI with the Freedom of Information Act. The FBI consciously attempts to limit what they search and they, they, they restrict it to what they call their central record system or CRS. And the primary database that they use there is called Sentinel. And this is where all the case management type files and all the rest of that are supposed to be. But I know on the basis of my conversations with multiple former FBI officials, uh, both agents and intelligence analysts now, that there's a lot of stuff that never makes its way into Sentinel. The FBI uses a specific Microsoft-based um, instant messaging system that is not required uh, to be uh, logged in any kind of you know, records management system. Uh, under National Archives and Records Administration regulations. And we also know that an awful lot of the time, emails, and so far as we are aware, the FBI is still using the Microsoft um, SharePoint system for their email. Not all emails necessarily get logged into the system either. So, and sometimes that's deliberate, right? Uh, and sometimes it's just carelessness. Uh, and frivolity. But we're very confident that there's more out there. And we are literally, uh, as we speak, uh, waiting for Judge Boesberg in the DC circuit here uh, to take a look at, in camera at a lot of the material that the Bureau has withheld so far in that uh, Cato v. FBI lawsuit. Going forward, uh, hopefully listeners understand, and again, go look at the timeline, but we'll put a link in the notes, but understand you know, that the government does this and they've been doing it for a long time and they will continue to do it. But recently we've had these discussions about domestic extremism and different groups, of course, after the coup, insurrection, riot, whatever you want to call it, this idea that we need to re-up and reinvigorate our ability to spy on possibly subversive domestic groups. So what, what's going on in that realm and and should we be concerned? Yeah. So for those who are interested, you know, the Bureau has been uh, involved at looking at so-called white supremacist or sovereign citizen or militia type groups <clears throat> at least as long as I've been alive. Uh, and I'm nearly 60. Now, a lot of my friends in the privacy and civil liberties community, including my my dear friend and colleague at the Brennan Center, Mike German, are of the opinion that the Bureau simply does not place the same level of priority on those groups as they have on, let's say, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, et cetera, et cetera. Because we don't have full access to the total number of reports that the, that the Bureau has done on these groups. I'm not sure that we can make that kind of a definitive assessment. My gut tells me that he's probably right simply based on history 
um, the history of the civil rights movement and all the rest of that. But they were definitely looking at the Oath Keepers, <clears throat> you know, a decade ago. Um, and, and there were plenty of reports about the Oath Keepers trying to recruit cops, trying to recruit uh, military personnel. We have one report. Um, I believe it's from the FBI Atlanta field office, I think. I'd have to go and double check that. But we have got one report um, about Oath Keepers buying billboard space. Uh, you know, near Savannah and Hinesville, Georgia, you know, near major American military installations trying to recruit folks. Now, um, that's probably largely covered, you know, under the First Amendment. I mean, there might be some commercial speech issues there. Trevor, you would be a better judge of that than I would. But a lot of this other activity that they were engaged in in, in that period, uh, you know, would have been covered under the First Amendment. That does not mean that there were not Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, folks like that that were uh, involved in criminal conduct. They clearly were. And we have some of those reports here as well. But I think, you know, what should give us all real concern, and this is why I was just going off so much last year about this Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act that uh, that Senator Durbin, who I like, I, I'll just say flat out, I like Dick Durbin a lot. Uh, but he and, and Brad Schneider had, uh, on the House side, had introduced this bill that I was of the opinion would simply create additional bureaucracies, you know, inside of, of the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, all the rest of that, that would number one, be duplicative, but that when, but would also give those officials the grounds to say, okay, you've given us these new offices, but you haven't given us additional authority, right? Because that's exactly where these kinds of, of debates and arguments almost inevitably end. It's like, well, you're asking us to do more. Clearly, we need more authority and so on and so forth. That's not true. Um, there are multiple statutes on the books right now, some of which, of course, are being used as we speak to prosecute people uh, who were involved in, in the events surrounding January 6th. So that's why I'm really concerned about this. It, it doesn't mean that um, looking at individual conduct uh, and, and individuals grouping together uh, you know, with bona fide uh, criminal intent isn't legitimate. That is legitimate, but you need to have a proper predicate for it. Uh, and just, you know, sitting around uh, utilizing all kinds of commercial surveillance software and tools to pull everything that you can off of YouTube and uh, TikTok and fill in the blank for the platform, right? Um, pulling all that kind of data together, getting people's credit reports and all the rest of that, essentially in a phishing expedition. I worry about that, not just from a rights violation standpoint. I worry about that in terms of missing actual potential intent. And I, I like to go back to this incident that happened. Thank God nobody was hurt. But this was Christmas of 2021, I think. The incident in Nashville, uh, where that, that bomb went off outside uh, the AT&T building. We find out after the fact that the Tennis Tennessee uh, law enforcement authorities had been approached by the bomber's uh, live-in girlfriend saying, He's got this trailer where he's making bombs, and they did not search the trailer. So when they when they get credible uh, leads and they're not followed up properly, that is when really bad things happen. This is what happened with the, with the uh, with the underwear bomber over Detroit uh, in the lead up to all of that. You know, his parent, his father came in to the embassy overseas and said, "I think my son is a threat." You should pay attention to those. You you really, if you're in law enforcement, you should really be paying attention to that kind of stuff. But I think there's a there's a level of laziness that's kind of crept in because of the ease of the use of these digital tools uh, and sitting around and being able to aggregate this stuff and open just a, a slew of investigations, assessments, whatever, without any kind of real predicate, more often than not, all it's creating is a lot of noise in the system. And that means almost invariably you're going to miss it. I think the biggest concern that I have, you know, more recently <clears throat> is what I've seen kind of on the left side of the spectrum um, with Antifa or even uh, Marxist or socialist groups now, or groups that have that kind of political orientation, self-professed political orientation, who have begun to arm themselves in exactly the same way that the three percenters and the Oath Keepers are arms. And to be clear, I am a gun owner. I have been a gun owner my entire adult life. Um, I'm a complete supporter of the Second Amendment. I believe that Heller, McDonald, and Bruin were all correctly decided. Many people would maybe argue about Bruin, but anyway, I, I tend to be I tend to be pretty hardcore when it comes to Second Amendment stuff. Um, but I have enough common sense to see that if you get two groups of basically armed militias, armed ideological militias, 
that wind up going at it on the streets of an American city or in an American suburban community. It isn't going to be just the people in those ideological militias that wind up wounding and killing each other. There are going to be a hell of a lot of other innocent people that are going to wind up getting taken out here. And that to me is where, you know, we need to have a lot of the kind of police reform that our colleagues, uh, Clark Neely and, and Jay Schweikert and others, you know, have talked about. Um, and I think that's a big complaint that has been coming out of the African American, the Asian American, the Latino American community for decades, um, is this kind of police bias. But a lot of these folks on the left, and I will say that some of these groups that we're talking about that I've also got FOIAs in on, to be clear, yes, I'm looking at both groups on the right and the left here, um, they don't trust the police. They don't trust the police to protect them. And that's why you're seeing uh, also people in, in the uh, LGBTQ community, uh, the gay and lesbian and transgender community, they are seeking to arm themselves. I don't blame them. You know, with, with, the, with the kind of hateful rhetoric and in some cases, hateful actions that are taking place here, I think they'd be crazy not to be finding ways to engage in self-defense, you know, whether that's learning martial arts or whether it's learning how to shoot, you know, a sidearm. Um, but we also can't walk away from the fact that with respect to these, these armed, organized groups, having them square off against each other is not in anybody's interest. It is, it is literally uh, a disaster waiting to happen. So my hope is by highlighting this problem, by trying to get folks to focus on this problem, and especially by trying to find ways to motivate police to you know, get their act cleaned up um, and, and to focus on making sure that these groups do not become you know, a massive public health uh, and public safety problem that we can, avert, uh, we can avert some major catastrophes here. So that's, that's become a, a big focus of mine over the course of the last six months or so. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us at Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.